Part One of Time Crime by H. Beam Piper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Douglas Nelson. Time Crime, Part One. Kiro Soran, the guard captain, stood in the shadow of the veranda roof, his white cloak thrown back to display the scarlet lining. He rubbed his palm reflectively on the checkered butt of his revolver and watched the four men at the table. "'And ten tens are a hundred, one of the clerks in blue jacket said, adding another stack to the pile of gold coins. Nineteen hundreds. One of the pair in dirty striped robes agreed, taking a stone from the box in front of him and throwing it away. Only one stone remained. One more hundred to pay. One of the blue-jacketed plantation clerks made a tally mark. His companion counted out coins, ten and ten and ten. Dosu Golan, the plantation manager, tapped impatiently on his polished bootleg with a thin riding whip. I don't like this he said in another and entirely different language. I know, chattel slavery's an established custom on this sector, and we have to conform to local usages, but it sickens me to have to haggle with these swine over the price of human beings. On the Zakartha sector we use nothing but free wage labor. Migratory workers, the guard captain said. Humanitarian considerations aside, I can think of a lot better ways of meeting the labor problem on a fruit plantation than by buying slaves you need for three months a year and have to feed and quarter and clothe and doctor the whole twelve. Twenty hundreds of obus, the clerk who had been counting the money said. That is the payment. Is it not, Korohin Irigad? That is the payment, the slave dealer replied. The clerk swept up the remaining coins and his companion took them over and put them in an iron-bound chest, snapping the padlock. The two guards who had been loitering at one side slung the rifles and picked up the chest, carrying it into the plantation house. The slave-dealer and his companion arose, putting their money into a leather bag. Koru Hin Irigad turned and bowed to the two men in white cloaks. "'The slaves are yours, noble lords,' he said." Across the plantation yard six more men in striped robes, with carbines slung across their backs, approached. With them came another man in a hooded white cloak, and two guards in blue jackets and red caps with bayoneted rifles. The man in white and his armed attendants came toward the house. The six Calera slavers continued across the yard to where their horses were picketed. "'I do not offend the noble lords, then.' Koru Hin Irigad said. I beg their sufferance to depart. I and my men have far to ride if we would reach Kariba by nightfall. The Lord, the great Lord, the Lord God Safar, watch between us until we meet again. Urado Alatana, the labor foreman, came up onto the porch as the two slavers went down. Have a good look at them, Rad, the guard captain asked. You think I'm crazy enough to let those bandits out of here with two thousand obus, forty thousand paratemporal exchange units of the company's money without knowing what we're getting? The other parried. They're all right. Nice, clean, healthy-looking lot. I did everything but take them apart and inspect the pieces while they were being unshackled at the stockade. I'd like to know where this Koro Hin What's-His-Name got them, though. They're not local stuff. Lot darker and they're jabbering among themselves in some lingo I never heard before. A few are wearing some rags of clothing, and they have odd-looking sandals. I noticed that most of them showed marks of recent whipping. That may mean they're troublesome, or it may just mean that these choleras are a lot of sadistic brutes. Poor devils! The man called Dosu Golan was evidently hoping that he'd never catch himself talking about fellow humans like that. The guard captain turned to him. "'Coming to have a look at them, Doth?' he asked. "'You go, Curve. I'll see them later.' "'Still not able to look the company's property in the face?' the captain asked gently. 
you'll not get used to it any sooner than now. I suppose you're right. For a moment, Dosu Golan watched Koro Hin Irigod and his followers canter out of the yard and break into a gallop on the road beyond. Then he tucked his whip under his arm. All right, then. Let's go see them. The labor foreman went into the house. The manager and the guard captain went down the steps and sat out across the yard. A big slat-sided wagon, drawn by four horses, driven by an old slave in a blue smock and a thing like a sunbonnet, rumbled past, loaded with newly picked oranges. Blue wood smoke was beginning to rise from the stoves at the open kitchen, and a couple of slaves were noisily chopping wood. Then they came to the stockade of close-set pointed poles. A guard sergeant in a red-trimmed blue jacket, armed with a revolver, met them with a salute which Kiro Soran returned. He unfastened the gate and motioned four or five riflemen into positions from which they could fire in between the poles in case the slaves turned on their new owners. There seemed little of that, though Kiro Soran kept his hand close to the butt of his revolver. The slaves, an even hundred of them, squatted under awnings out of the sun, or stood in line to drink at the water-butt. They furtively watched the two men who had entered among them, as though expecting blows or kicks. When none were forthcoming, they relaxed slightly. As the labor foreman had said, they were clean and looked healthy. They were all nearly naked. There were about as many women as men, but no children or old people. "'Rad's right,' the captain told the new manager. "'They're not local. Much darker skins, and different face structure. Faces wedge-shaped instead of oval, and differently shaped noses, and brown eyes instead of black. I've seen people like that somewhere, but—' He fell silent. A suspicion, utterly fantastic, had begun to form in his mind and he stepped closer to a group of a dozen-odd, the manager following him. One or two had been unmercifully lashed, not long ago, and all bore a few lash marks. Odd sort of marks, more like burn blisters than welts. He'd have to have the company doctor look at them. Then he caught their speech, and the suspicion was converted to certainty. These are not like the others. They wear fine garments and walk proudly. They look stern, but not cruel. They are the real masters here. The others are but servants. He grasped the manager's arm and drew him aside. You know that language? he asked. When the man called Dosu Golan shook his head, he continued. That's Karanda. It's a dialect spoken by a people in the Ganges Valley in India, on the Kolgore sector of the fourth level. Dosu Golan blinked, and his face went blank for a moment. "'You mean they're from out-time?' he demanded. "'Are you sure?' "'I did two years on fourth-level Kolgore with the Paratime Police before I took this job,' the man called Kiro Soran replied. "'And another thing. Those lash marks were made with some kind of an electric whip, not these rawhide quirts the Caleras use.' It took the plantation manager all of five seconds to add that up. The answer frightened him. Kirv, this is going to make a simply hideous uproar, all the way up to home timeline main office, he said. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I know what I have to do. The captain raised his voice, using the local language. Sergeant, run to the guardhouse and tell Sergeant Adorada to mount up twenty of his men and take off after those Caleras who sold us these slaves. They're headed down the road toward the river. Tell them to bring them all back, and especially their chief, Koru Hin Irigod, and I want him alive and able to answer questions. And then get the white cloak Lord Orado Alatina and come back here. Yes, Captain. The guards were all Yurana people. They disliked Caleras intensely. The sergeant, through a salute, turned and ran. "'Next we'll have to isolate these slaves,' Kiro Soran said. "'You better make a full report to the company as soon as possible. I'm going to transpose to police terminal timeline and make my report to the sector regional subchief. 
Then— Now wait a moment, Curve, Dosu Golan protested. After all, I'm the manager, even if I am new here. It's up to me to make the decisions. Kiro Soran shook his head. Sorry, Doth, not this one, he said. You know the terms under which I was hired by the company. I'm still a field agent of the Paratime Police, and I'm reporting back on duty as soon as I can transpose to police terminal. Look, here are a hundred men and women who have been shifted from one timeline on one paratemporal sector of probability to another. Why, the world from which these people came doesn't even exist in this space-time continuum. There's only one way they could have gotten here, and that's the way we did, in a galdron hesthor paratemporal transposition field. You can carry it on from there as far as you like, but the only thing it adds up to is a case for the Paratime Police. You had better include in your report mention that I've reverted to police status. My company pay ought to be stopped as of now, and until somebody who outranks me is sent here, I'm in complete charge. Paratime Transposition Code, Section 17, Article 238. The plantation manager nodded. Kiro Soran knew how he must feel. He laid a hand gently on the younger man's shoulder. You understand how it is, Doth. This is the only thing I can do. I understand, Kerv. Count on me for absolutely anything. He looked at the brown-skinned slaves, and lines of horror and loathing appeared around his mouth. To think that some of our own people would do a thing like this! I hope you catch the devils. Are you transposing out now? In a few minutes. While I'm gone, have the doctor look at those whip injuries. Those things could get infected. Fortunately, he's one of our own people. Yes, of course. And I'll have these slaves isolated. And if Adorada brings back Koro Hin Irigad and his gang before you get back, I'll have them locked up and waiting for you. I suppose you want to narco-hypnotize and question the whole lot, slaves and slavers? The labor foreman, known locally as Urado Alatina, entered the stockade. "'What's wrong, Kerv? he asked. The Paratime police agent told him briefly. The labor foreman whistled, threw a quick glance at the nearest slaves, and nodded. "'I knew there was something funny about them,' he said. "'Doth, what a simply beastly thing to happen, two days after you take charge here!' "'Not his fault,' the Paratime police agent said. "'I'm the one the company'll be sore at, but I'd rather have them down on me rather than old Tortha Karf. Well, sit on the lid till I get back,' he told the both of them. We'll need some kind of a story for the locals. Let's see. Explain to the guards, in the hearing of some of the more talkative slaves, that these slaves are from the Asian mainland, that they are of a people friendly to our people, and that they were kidnapped by pirates, our enemies. That ought to explain everything satisfactorily. On his way back to the plantation house, he saw a clump of local slaves staring curiously at the stockade and noticed that the guards had unslung their rifles and fixed their bayonets. None of them had any idea, of course, of what had happened, but they all seemed to know, by some sort of ESP, that something was seriously wrong. It was going to get worse, too, when strangers began arriving, apparently from nowhere, at the plantation. Verkan Vall waited until the small, dark-eyed woman across the circular table had helped herself from one of the bowls on the revolving disc in the middle, then rotated it to bring the platter of cold boar ham around to himself. "'Want some of this, Della?' he asked, transferring a slice of ham and a spoonful of wine sauce to his plate. "'No, I'll have some of the venison,' the black-haired girl beside him said. "'And some of the pickled beans.' We'll be getting our fill of pork for the next month. I thought the Dwarma sector people were vegetarians, Jandar Jard, the theatrical designer, said. Most nonviolent peoples are, aren't they? Well, the Dwarma people haven't any specific taboo against taking life, Branath Zara, the dark-eyed woman in the brightly colored gown, told him. They're just utterly non-combative, non-aggressive. 
when I was on the Dwarma sector there was a horrible scandal at the village where I was staying. It seems that a farmer and a meat butcher fought over the price of a pig. They actually raised their voices and shouted contradictions at each other. That happened two years before, and people were still talking about it. I didn't think they had any money, either, Verkan Vall's wife, Hadron Dalla, said. They don't, Zara said. It's all barter and trade. What are you and Val going to use for a visible means of support while you're there? Oh, I have my mandolin, and I've learned all the traditional Dwarma songs by Hypnomech, Dalla said. And Trans-Time Tours is fitting Val out with a bag of tools. He's going to do repair work and carpentry. Oh, good, you'll be welcome anywhere, Zara the sculptress said. They're always glad to entertain a singer, and for people who do the fine decorative work they do, they're the most incompetent practical mechanics I've ever seen or heard of. You're going to travel from village to village? Yes. The cover story is that we're lovers who have left our village in order not to make Val's former wife unhappy by our presence, Dalla said. Oh, good! That's entirely in the Dwarma romantic tradition, Branath Zara approved. Ordinarily, you know, they don't like to travel. They have a saying, Happy are the trees, they abide in their own place. Sad are the winds, forever they wander. But that'll be a fine explanation. Thalvan Drass, the big man with the black beard and the long red coat and cloth of gold sash who lounged in the host seat, laughed. I can just see Val mending pots and Dalla playing that mandolin and singing, he said. At least you'll be getting away from police work. I don't suppose they have anything like police on the Dwarma sector. Oh, no, they don't even have any such concept, Bronath Zara said. When somebody does something wrong, his neighbors all come and talk to him about it till he gets ashamed. Then they all forgive him and have a feast. They're lovely people, so kind and gentle. But you'll get awfully tired of them in about a month. They have absolutely no respect for anybody's privacy. In fact, it seems slightly indecent to them for anybody to want privacy. One of Thalva and Dra's human servants came into the room, coughed apologetically, and said, A visiphone call for his valor, the Mavrad of Neros. Val went on nibbling ham and wine sauce. The servant repeated the announcement a trifle more loudly. Val, you're being paged, Thalvan Dras told him, with a touch of impatience. Verkan Val looked blank for an instant, then grinned. It had been so long since he had even bothered to think about that antiquated title of nobility. Val's probably forgotten that he has a title. A girl across the table, wearing an almost transparent gown and nothing else, laughed. "'That's something the Mavrad of Minerna and Thalvabar never forgets,' Jandar Jar drawled, with what, in a woman, would have been caddishness. Thalvan Dras gave him a hastily repressed look of venomous anger, then said something, more to Verkan Vall than to Jandar Jard, about titles of nobility being the marks of social position and responsibility which their bearer should never forget. That jab, Vol thought, followed the servant out of the room, had been a mistake on Jard's part. A music drama from which he had designed the settings was due to open here in Durgabar in another ten days. Thalvan Dras would cherish spite, and a word from the Mavrad of Minerna and Thalvabar would set a dozen critics to disparaging Jandar's work. On the other hand, maybe it had been smart of Jandar Jard to antagonize Thal von Dras. For every critic who bowed slavishly to the wealthy nobleman, there were at least two more who detested him unutterably, and they would rush to Jandar Jard's defense, and in the ensuing uproar the settings would get more publicity than the drama itself. In the visiphone booth, Val found a girl in a green blouse, with the Paratime Police insignia on her shoulder, looking out of the screen. The wall behind her was pale green, striped in gold and black. "'Hello, Eldra,' he greeted her. "'Hello, Chief's Assistant. I'm sorry to bother you, but the Chief wants to talk to you. 
Just a moment, please. The screen exploded into a kaleidoscopic flash of lights and colors, then cleared again. This time, a man looked out of it. He was well into middle age, close to his three hundredth year. His hair, a uniform iron gray, was beginning to thin in front, and he was acquiring the beginnings of a double chin. His name was Tortha Karf, and he was chief of Paratime Police and Verkan Vall Superior. Hello, Vall. Glad I was able to locate you. When are you and Dalla leaving? As soon as we can get away from this luncheon here. Oh, say, an hour? We're taking a rocket to Zarabar and transposing from there to Passenger Terminal 16, and from there to the Dwarma Sector. Well, Vol, I hate to bother you like this, Tortha Karf said, but I wish you'd stop by headquarters on your way to the rocket port. Something's come up. It may be a very nasty business, and I'd like to talk to you about it. Well, Chief, let me remind you that this vacation, which I've had to postpone four times already, has been overdue for four years, Val said. Yes, Val, I know. You've been working very hard, and you and Dalla are entitled to a little time together. I just want you to look into something before you leave. It'll have to take some fast looking. Our rocket blasts off in two hours. It may take a little longer. If it does, you and Dalla can transpose to police terminal and take a rocket for Zarabar equivalent, and transpose from there to passenger 16. It would save time if you brought Dalla with you to headquarters. Dalla won't like this, Vol understated. No, I'm afraid not. Tortha Karf looked around apprehensively, as though estimating the damage an enraged Hadran Dalla could do to his office furnishings. Well, try to get here as soon as you can. Thalvan Drass was holding forth when Vol returned on one of his favorite preoccupations. Reason I'm taking such an especially active interest in this year's arts exhibitions. I've become disturbed at the extent to which so many of our artists have been content to derive their motifs, even their techniques, from out-time art. He was using his vocal writer rather than his conversational voice. I yield to no one in my appreciation of out-time art. You all know how devotedly I collect objects of art from all over Paratime. But our own artists should endeavor to express their artistic values in our own artistic idioms. Val bent over his wife's shoulder. We have to leave right away, he whispered. But a rocket doesn't blast off for two hours. Thal von Drass had stopped talking and was looking at them in annoyance. I have to go to headquarters before we leave. It'll save time if you come along. Oh, no, Val! She looked at him in consternation. Was that Tortha Karf calling? She replaced her plate on the table and got to her feet. I'm dreadfully sorry, Drass, he addressed their host. I just had a call from Tortha Karf. A few minor details that must be cleared up before I leave home timeline. If you'll accept our thanks for a wonderful luncheon. Well, certainly, Val. Brogoth, will you call? He gave a slight chuckle. I'm so used to having Brogoth Zoln at my elbow that I've forgotten he wasn't here. Wait, I'll call one of the servants to have a car for you. Don't bother. We'll take an air cab, Val told him. But you simply can't take a public cab. The black-bearded nobleman was shocked at such an obscene idea. I will have a car ready for you in a few minutes. Sorry, Dross, we have to hurry. We'll get a cab on the roof. Goodbye, everybody. Sorry to have to break away like this. See you all when we get back. End of Part One